All right, and welcome to another episode of uh, the Tigers Minor League Report uh, podcast here. I, I am uh, Chris Brown. With me is Rogelio Castillo, and we are very pleased to be joined by a special guest today. He's a former big leaguer, a former college head coach, a former minor league uh, manager. He was uh, in the 2005 Futures game at Clemerick Park, and he is, of course, the current vice president of player development for the Detroit Tigers, Ryan Garko. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so we always like to ask our, our first-time guests uh, about their earliest baseball memory, and we were just discussing, you're almost exactly the same age as us, so it, it wouldn't shock us if uh, it's it's familiar to us, but we'd love to hear it. Oh, boy. You know, I think probably just going back to, to the the first team I played on, we were the, we were the Cardinals. Um, my dad was a coach. It was underhand pitch back then. Um, Still, my parents still live in the house we grew up in. So when I when I go back and see his fish around the holidays, go back home, drive by the field we played at. But um, just remember that little Cardinals club and and um, just going out with dad and and falling in love with the game like at the very beginning and still have friends from that team that that when I see when I go home and and our first coach name was Harold Davis. Still keep it with Harold. He kind of stayed in my life to this day. He's he always stayed in with me like throughout came came and saw me when we play the angels and stuff. So um, that first, the pizza place, we used to go to our pizza party. So I take my son there now. So just those like fun memories of just, I have a nine year old son now and like we're going to pizza parties and, and the same stuff that we used to, those are, those are the good memories I had of that first, the, the Walnut, Walnut Pony baseball Cardinals was, was where it all started. That's, that's outstanding. I have a nine year old too. And, and as much as I love baseball, I, I keep trying to get him to play. Uh, he just, he doesn't, he doesn't care. I used to get him, you mentioned walnuts. I would pitch him green walnuts to have him hit him with the bat because I thought he'd enjoy destroying oh, those. And yeah. he did, but, uh, you know, it's just not his thing. He's more into uh, Fortnite and Roblox and stuff. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, that's awesome. Uh, I, were, you, were you just immediately awesome at baseball or was it uh, took a while before you developed um, into a future big leaguer? No, you know, I played all sports as a kid, which I, I, you know, have my son doing now. I think all kids should should do. I played soccer, played, you know, in the fall and basketball in the winter and then and then baseball in the spring. I did grow up in California, so we could play outside year round. So um, and then was a high school football player. Uh, I think I think you know, it was different back then, too. Like the, the travel ball scene was so different. Um, just played in my local rec, you know, town league. Um, I do think I had a really I was blessed. I had a really good high school coach who um, he, he kind of identified like, hey, you may be able to do this beyond beyond high school. Tom Tereszczyk was his name and helped my dad and me. Like Then he did kind of connect me with some travel ball, different different clubs, and was able to play through the summer. So um, when, when I got to high school, I think started realizing, you know, college, I, I just wanted to go to college, you know, and, and try to play beyond the high school level. So um, and then, you know, was able to to have a pretty nice little high school career and and go to college and, and keep going. So. Still in it. I always kind of, I always thought I'd have to go back to school and do something different. But I've I've been really blessed to you know have a life in baseball. Yeah. Once they started throwing curveballs in high school for me, it was over. Uh, I just couldn't. <laughs> I can uh, the, the house league and I played travel yeah. ball till I was eight, 18. But after that, I was just basically a backup. But I was I was fine with it when when guys were telling me they could see the seams from a. a fastball coming at them and i was like I, it just looks like a white blur they're like yeah maybe kind of <laughs> hanging up but um yeah but uh so ryan there's been this was a really good year I and mean, you saw two teams going to the postseason you saw lakeland you saw erie and there was a lot of development within one of the first things we heard when we were out west michigan was the nutrition little things like that and it seems mm -hmm. like little the the little things that people don't think about went into the growth this year and and with Lakeland, for example, there was, I, I think, it, it, in terms of pitching, it seems like there was a series of pitchers. If we're talking about Troy Melton coming out of nowhere, sorry, Gibson Long learning uh, change up, and they were talking about learning and implementing these things. How is that when you come to the, when they come to the, when the players come to in spring training, you guys give them a plan? Is it just something that, how does that all work? How does it plan when they go into the season? Do they have like this? specific plan when they start the season yeah <laughs> well, they do so one of the things when i was first hired in you know 2021 that we did talk about was um individualized player plans for for every single player and and you're from the the academy all the way to triple a until we pass them off to you know the 40-man roster and it still continues i mean i think you hear scott say it all the time 
even in, in the major leagues, we want a culture of development. Like number one, because we're gonna have young players get to the big leagues that aren't aren't finished. And number two, even a player like Michael Lorenzen, like that was real major league development for a player who became an all-star because you know, Chris Fetter and our analysts and our strength coaches, our nutritionists there help Michael, I think, have the best year of his career. So um, the culture of development that Scott talks about, obviously in player development, like it was such a good fit when Scott got hired because that is exactly what you know we talk about every day in, in the minor leagues. But I mean, it, and you know, you, you said nutrition. I think that we call it, I call it you know, our performance um, branch. So that's medical, strength, nutrition, mental performance, um, all of those areas, like those are the margin ads that I feel like, especially in the second year of, of me being here and the group we, you know, we're able to bring in, we're really le trying to lean into those areas. The baseball is going to get done, right? Like we're going to play every night at seven o'clock at all these different levels. Like we have really good coaches everywhere. I think we do a pretty good job, um, in terms of our baseball instruction, whether it's pitching or hitting, but like what can we unlock medically? Like the way the body's moving, like our, our sports performance group led by Georgia Giblin, like what, what data can we find in there? And, you know, whether it's deficiencies or whether it's things they do really well that we can lean into to help a guy like Sawyer, um, you know, find a cutter, find a better change up, find a better sinker, like in season. Um, you know, so a lot of times the players sort of point us in the direction that the player plan is going to go just by the way they perform and the way their body moves. And then we have a lot of really good coaches and staff members that whether it's in the weight room or the, the training room or, or behind a computer somewhere supporting those coaches with, with and like, like sometimes they don't work, right? Like sometimes we have a plan for a player. We try to do something and it just doesn't work, but that's okay. Like it doesn't mean that it was, a, it wasn't a wasted effort because the thought going into it was really good. Like ultimately like all the credit goes to Sawyer, right? Like Sawyer was able to make these adjustments. Reese Olson like made some really good adjustments. Like the player gets all the credit in the end because they're the one that's to go out there and do it. We just try to have really good plans behind them, supporting them. And and that, you know, brings me to I was curious about how you know, like, okay, this this is not working. We need to step back on this, you know, this this is getting in his head or something like that. Is it or or on the opposite? end of the spectrum like whoa this is really working really well he's he's way better quicker than we thought like how do you adjust how dynamic are these dev plans um you know i think kenny graham talks about it a lot our director of hitter like there's there's just the raw stats and then there's all the granular numbers that um exist kind of behind just the batting average and slugging percentage and home runs and things and so a lot of what we're doing is digging into those to those granular numbers um whether that's, um, you know, I think like Justice Bigby, right? Like Kenny Graham is like way before Justice had the year he had, has always been pointing to like Bigby had really good. He hit the ball really hard and he made really good swing decisions. He just hit a lot of ground balls. So like there was just a mechanical adjustment that they talked about last off season and then some contact points of just catching the ball a little bit farther out in front, like hoping to get the ball in the air. Like again, to Justice's credit, like he's the one that made the both adjustments, worked really hard to to make those two adjustments. But like I, like Kenny Graham, like all the credit goes to him because he has been saying for two years like this was going to come with Big B because all that there's just so much smoke. Like you just sort of see good and bad. You know, you just see smoke behind the numbers of like, hey, like there are really good things happening, even though the top line stats maybe aren't what we want them to be. We can see there's some really good things happening, like whether it's batted ball data or swing decisions or contact points or, or release points or like, you know, metrics on a pitch. Um, there are just these, these warning signals. We, we, our coaches will see, our analysts will see that point us in the right direction. You know, that's interesting because we, we had somebody, uh, you know, was really curious about what kind of uh, stats you guys like to use, you know, and we, we've been able to incorporate some of the, the Hawkeye data from triple a and, and, and down in the Florida state league and stuff like that. And we've, you know, some of it's all there for you to use, but we also like to check out for like, hey, 95th ex, uh, percentile exit velocity and, and mm -hmm. try to figure out induced vertical break and things like that. And I, I'm curious if you want to share anything that's kind of publicly available that you guys really look at or or you don't have to if you don't want to give away trade secrets. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't give away too much. Scott will probably he'll find this somehow. Um, <laughs> I would say... Um, you know, I think, look, like Scott said it day one, like the, the dominate the strike zone 
part of this organization is real and uh, everything successful. I, it's so true. It sounds so simple, but it's so true. Our players that are dominating the strike zone, whether it's as a hitter or as a pitcher, give us a chance to, it's a, it's got, it's foundational for everything we do. Um, you know, I, I'd even say this. So, you know, you mentioned like, um, in, in, you know, vertical approach angle or, or even, or even just like horizontal or, or vertical movement, like, they're great, right? Like we all love spin and we all love like horizontal or, or vertical movement, but like release point matters and horizontal release point matters. And like, what's the hitter scene matters. There's guys that have like turbo stuff that hitters just see them really good. Like, and it's just really clean. So like nothing plays independently. Like it's all, it's all these, it's like, and that's where like, I think as we've gotten to know the players better and build better relationships and just see them like globally, um been able to make some better decisions on the development side because it's never just one stat because so many you can hit the ball you can hit the ball harder than anyone in the world but like if you don't swing at strikes it doesn't matter you know or or vice versa you know you can have the best swing decisions you know so it's it's always just that a combination of of all these different things that that um but like the thing that never changes is like if you don't swing at strikes like it doesn't matter if you don't throw strikes it doesn't matter so like we do really stay rooted in the zone um just like Scott always talks about. And and that's one of those things where there are certain things that, that you, you can't develop, right? Like like uh like Chris Myers isn't gonna start running three nine first mm-hmm. base. It's just not there physically. But I've always been kind of curious about strike zone discipline for hitters, if they can really improve that or if that's something that's more innate. I mean, and same goes with pitchers. You know, if you've got an athletic delivery or if you don't have an athletic delivery, can you can you hone in your command to at least to a playable level? I mean, look, I, I think you're like, the, we asked this question, I think on every pitching coach interview we have, like rank out velocity, you know, command or stuff. Um, you know, velocity, I do think remains the biggest marker of success. So like we, we I, I absolutely, you know, like or swing decisions. It's like, I think you, we can, we can train them both. We can train both. I mean, the one thing that we are certainly like not running away from are guys with big tools that maybe need work in those areas. Like, cause those are more often than not the, the guys who end up being major leaguers and like impacting the baseball. Right. So if you hit the ball really, really hard, but your swing decisions need work, the hitting the ball really hard is a lot. It's hard to teach a guy to gain eight or nine or, 10 miles per hour of exit velocity or to throw harder. <clears throat> but if somebody does those things, then we can, and, and like we try to be really creative with how we practice. And that's where like Max Gordon and, and Kenny Graham, again, like they're really good at creating environments where we do work on those things. Like I know the the most important thing is just getting at bats and going out and seeing it every night. But if you go watch our batting practice, especially, you know, FCL or Lakeland, very rarely is it just a coach throwing 40 mile per hour, you know, balls right down the middle where there's machines involved. There's usually multiple machines involved and, and decisions. And we're trying to train the decision-making just as much as we are the, the actual mechanics of the swing. And, and, spe- and speaking of swing mechanics too, looking at somebody like Christian Santana last year, kind of mm-hmm. admittedly kind of had a, a down year, but he still had a good eye. He still was walking. Is it, where is that part where it's more like a, a not necessarily swing mechanics, but maybe perhaps like something in between the ears a little bit. Yeah. You know, I think, I think like with Christian specifically, we, we dive into some of the batted ball data. Like the nice thing, especially too now is we can get, whether it's with hot guy or with a blast sensor, like we really can't get some, like some data on like what the barrel's doing and trying to, you know, get on plane and stay on plane. It, it's, it's a, it's a real thing that we can track. It's not just a coach, you know, watching video and kind of like clicking through the video, like guessing. Um, I think with Christian, like we do always need to remember, like he's two years younger than the league. Like you said, he still is making really good decisions, which is hard to teach. And he does still hit the ball hard. Um, there are, we just, I got, and it goes like, we've got to get him on plane. He's got to get on plane earlier. He's got to stay on plane longer. Like, I think like we talk about like that granular data, like, there's a lot of foul balls. Like there's a lot of pop-ups in there, which just shows to us like, Hey, like he's swinging at the right pitches and he actually is on time. It's just the barrels off a little bit. So we're getting some foul balls. 
or more pop-ups than what like is normal for the for the league. So <clears throat> then it's like, okay, like maybe this is like we don't we don't run to mechanics always because I think you can kind of get lost. Um, I've been in organizations where it's mechanics like first and, and hitters just kind of become so caught up in the mechanics that they forget to just play the game. But I think Kenny does a good job and, and we do a good job of when it, you know, making sure that it is a mechanical issue and then, and then we address it as needed. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting because there are, you hear these stories about kind of drastic changes, right? Drastic swing changes or, you know, changing guys arm mm -hmm. slot and stuff like that. And, and it does feel like occasionally that sort of thing is needed, but I'm always curious about when somebody goes, okay, we really need to change this. Uh, and, you know, there are different degrees of it. We went to Christian Santana. It's probably a little too, too steep of a swing. Um, we asked Roberto Campos at uh, Whitecaps uh, media day last year. And we were like, Hey, you hit the ball really hard. How are you going to try to get in the air more? And he's like, my job is to hit the ball hard. And we're like, all right, Mm -hmm. If I get it, that's fine. It, it, you don't want to screw up your swing. And then with like with Justice Bigby, you talked about it. Um, mm -hmm. Incredible ability to drive the ball the opposite field. But we were talking to JJ Cooper from from Baseball America yesterday, and he's like, you know, "What happens when when he starts getting 96, 97 on his hands consistently? Can he mm -hmm. turn on that? And and at what point do you try to rework a guy's swing um, without screwing up what got him to this point? I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's always just a conversation amongst the, the hitting group and then the player himself. I think, like you said, those like, you know, the gurus are everywhere, right? They're on Twitter. They're in our players' ears. Um, <clears throat> they're really good in the offseason of putting a guy in a cage and putting a ball on a tee or, or or front tossing them and making them look look great, right? Because there's never any any competition. So we uh, we and and like all the all the all the hitting guys that are out there usually like they they are giving the the right advice you know they all kind of have the the part of of the swing they lean into um but they don't they're not there in april and may when the bullets start flying and guys guys have to actually you know result a little bit so i think um i think the big b example is more of of what we lean into it was a smaller change leaning into what he's already really good at it does get a little bit harder if you really start trying to change someone's hands or change their load um it's hard because you know these these guys have been hitting their entire lives they've taken millions of swings a certain way so the changes are going to be more incremental um than than you know the big swing change i think you know justin turner is kind of that example everybody uses um, I think we, we just kind of, we try to chase the, the, the rule, not, not sort of that like outlier that that's out there. Um, and just lean into what they're already really good at and just try to, you know, point them into, into smaller changes that can hopefully lead to some, some success. And that comes to mind too, with somebody like Kyder Montero, who uh, the couple of years before he just was in the white cast rotation, wasn't really sure. And then he just, Last August, all of a sudden, just turned it on, and he was able to. He already had a pretty good slider, and then he continued to add to that and went three levels this year. Is that an example of that? Because I feel like him, and along with even a guy like I know Carlos Pena doesn't have the velocity, but he's pretty good locating. And I know he hasn't, from my understanding, hasn't pitched very long either. And um, from prospect side of things, people look at his age, but realize that he's only pitched a few seasons professionally. Yeah, you know, Kyder is an interesting one. When I got hired in 2021, Chris Fetter and I had worked together in LA. He was one of Fetter's favorite pitchers when I got here. And he's like, this guy's got some of the best stuff in our organization. Um, so it was had been flagged. Like everybody knew the stuff was there. And then in 22, I mean, it really wasn't a great year. Kyder, Kyder scuffled. Same coaches, like same staff, like same, trying to do the same things with him. Um, <clears throat> you know, like to his credit and our pitching group's credit, like, came back in 20 he worked really hard in the offseason came back like it just things seemed to click um the one thing that like really like took off was we were able to translate a lot of our a lot of our material that we'd already been using we were able to translate like our scouting reports and just his player plan everything like we made a really big effort in 23 to put everything in spanish so that some of the the international players weren't you know having things translated to them or and kyder like told us like he was able to prepare better for games. He's able to understand who he was better by having everything translated for him. And 
So it's something like we had learned, and now we do we tr we do for everything is just just as, something as simple as that. Where like I think it helped a lot, like really explain to Kyra like the why behind we were what we were doing, and he made a comment himself like it just it just really helped him understand like how his all four of his pitches work, how to attack right hand left hand hitters, and and then, then he just let the good stuff play because he does have some of the best stuff in the organization. Yeah, you know that's really fascinating too, and it's you. Like going back to the, your your stuff up your talk about like uh, nutrition and and you know health, making sure guys get enough sleep. It, it all seems somewhat um, obvious, but it wasn't always done, right? You, you know, I I been covering minor leagues fairly closely since about like 2015, and I remember going to the locker room after the games, and there'd be Little Caesars pizza or like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and then it's a you know a six hour bus ride. You're like that's not the best way to prepare these guys to play, and, and uh, it is it, those small things uh, do seem to. to factor in a big deal and and you know I, I don't mean to disparage anybody who was here before you or anything like that but we have noticed a very uh marked improvement in player development over the last like just guys getting better across the board in in terms of not even guys who, who are necessarily prospects but but guys who may have just washed out before becoming quality organizational players mm -hmm. and and that goes back to i think that individualized plans uh, which is, it's just, it's nice to see. I, I don't mean to, I don't, there's not a question in here. I just kind of want to compliment you because we see it and yeah. we're not, you know, we're just laymen, right? But it's, it's obvious. We go to the games, we see these guys getting better month over month, year over year. Because for example, like somebody like Lyle Arcar Jr., when people look at his stats, they always use that, you know, they judge the box score. But then when you get to talk to him, we talked to him about him learning a split finger, it made him a completely different pitcher, and really, in, in my in my opinion, at least, helped Erie save the season in a sense when they're getting calls up to AAA. And I thought Lockhart did a really good job of holding it down. Yeah, no, I I appreciate that. I know you guys are at a lot of games. I I will say this: like when we were hired, um, and I, I'm thankful to Al Avila. You know, Al hired me and and allowed us to bring in a lot of new staff. Like. I just want to give all my on-field coaches as affiliate coaches a lot of credit in, in the what you said, just the day-to-day, -day, like and like, like Scott Hammond at home, like throwing strikes, like playing really good defense, like not throwing away at bats, um, the way we work, the way we prepare, like just respecting the game. Like so like I'm as new school as it gets, and like I do lean pretty hard into um data and and just whatever is like the newest thing out there we're always chasing it. but also like we're still rooted in like pretty traditional like old school baseball values of like just being prepared and playing hard and like caring we don't ever talk about winning in the minor leagues like we don't i don't care like i don't care if we win or lose like obviously like when Erie got toward the end like we we wanted to win you know but the winning is a result of our process um and and without ever talking about winning once, like we have played pretty good baseball the last couple of years at all the different affiliates, and like never shied away from making moves. Like like you said, like Erie, like it wasn't fair. We weren't going to hold Justice Bigby back from that month in AAA to try to win a, an Erie championship. Like we were going to call somebody else up and like let Daniel Cabrera and and Brady Allen play, man, because they're like they, you know what I mean. So like we've never yeah. like chased it, but um, <clears throat> my my managers and our staff. Um, the care level is super high and, I, and like that'll never go away. And, and, and I agree, look, like you can't tell me, like we don't even use the term organizational player because like you just can't tell me who's going to be in the big leagues and who's not like it, it's fair for everybody. They, they have real chances if they do the things that, that Scott wants to go, to go to Detroit and play for them. Uh, it, it, yeah, I, I, it's a common scouting parlance or whatever, so I use. I don't mean to disparage anybody. But oh, yeah, no, they're, they're, I, I don't like, care. I don't. No, of course, it's, no. it's a term used everywhere. <laughs> but you're right. Like I, three, four years ago, I wouldn't have. I, when I was watching Dane Myers, uh, you know, throw 89 miles an hour in West Michigan, I wouldn't have pictured him as a future big league position player. It's, it's. You don't know until these these guys get a chance. Um, and, and what you mentioned though, it's it's really interesting. It's something that I've always been curious about for for years now because these are professional athletes. You're a professional athlete when you get on the field. I think maybe maybe in mid-August in Beloit and you're 20 games behind, you don't care that much about winning, but you're a professional athlete, you're out there, you want to win. And we used to, maybe 2019, there were people complaining about Parker Meadows bunting every game. Like, why is he bunting every game? Let, let, the, let the big dog eat or whatever. And we, we asked him, and he was like, you know what? Um, sometimes I just want to help my team. I want to get on base. I want to have that knock. And because, you know, I see you're walking up to the plate scoreboards right there you see you're hitting 210 or something like that you're a professional athlete you've got pride 
So I just wonder how you can communicate to the players to balance that that need to win with the need like, hey, you're doing what you need to be doing. You're yeah. progressing as a player. It's just you don't see it in the stats yet. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, it's just staying rooted in our processes and then and then backing it up with our actions, right? So if we if we value swing decisions um, and we value how hard you hit the ball and we value um, making, con- you know, putting the ball in play and like your walk versus strikeout ratio, it it means like we we back up back that up with how we like are treating the you know talking with the player like and maybe his batting average or or th- isn't isn't great like and, and like we're gonna dive deeper right like we're gonna look at batting average on balls in play and it might just be unlucky like sample size matters but you know I think the strike zone going back to it is like the real one like guys who are dominating the strike zone and making good decisions they're they're going to get more out they're going to continue good opportunities here like that that to me is like us backing up our 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 words with actions of like we are process driven because you know obviously like it's uh, if you're talking former player right results matter right like at some point like the you know go back you look at major leaguers the minor leagues they have, they have pretty good numbers like the stats usually show up but in the case of uh um i don't know a uh, big it's just you know bigby did not it wasn't good in lakeland a year ago and then he went all the way you know he ran through the system Carrie Carpenter, right? Like guys can make adjustments and guys can make those little changes and and put themselves into a different class of player. And like we tell the players that all the time is ultimately like your performance is going to determine like how the organization views you. And you can't tell me that it's unfair. Carrie was such a beautiful example because he was not playing. He, was, he broke camp, not playing every day in Erie, finished the season in the big leagues, you know, and and earned it, like earned it every every step of the way. And so having someone like Kerry, even now Sawyer, right? Like Sawyer traded, kind of thrown in that trade by the by the twins, like made a bunch of adjustments, like did the work on his own when it went up in September and was striking everybody out. Like so when guys go do it, it makes it so easy to stand in front of the room and say, like, every person in this room should want to be the next Sawyer Gibson Long or Kerry Carpenter. Or I mean, I think what it well, a good sign to me is somebody like, for example, Trey Cruz and Winsiel Perez. Winsiel Perez came out in the outfield, and I remember his he had an outfield assist in Hartford, which was just mind-boggling considering the, kind of the mental makeup he has at second base. But Trey Cruz starting on center field, that's where I, I think you guys have done a really good job of just trying new things and seeing how it works. And as a result, and Gabe Alvarez talked to us after they won that as a result, Cruz was their best defensive outfielder. I, I would have never thought that at the beginning of the season. And so for 2024, is there it, it, those those surprises going to continue to happen where we're going to see a player who is maybe like, you know, I know Jose Brasenio comes to mind too because people are like, oh, he, he's a future first baseman. But I know, I, I paraphrase, I think you said he he's going to be a catcher because he has those tools. Um, but is there anybody that you expect to just to kind of come out of, out of nowhere, in other words, for – from from a prospect standpoint, I want to shout. Cool. You put me on the spot. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, that's a, they're all his beautiful children. You know, um, <laughs> boy. Um, Without you not come out of nowhere, it's hard for me because I know them all so well. I I do think Peyton Graham's going to come back and have a really good year. I, it was a really frustrating first season for him. I know he's a second round pick, so it's hard to say it's like a out of nowhere, but. Um, you know, had a, a bunch of little nagging injuries. Uh, taught, he's having a really good off season. He's gained some weight um, and he's hungry to come back. Like he's, he's mad about the way this year went. Um, I'm still a really big believer in Peyton. The tools are some of the best in our organization. Um, boy, come out of nowhere. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, look, somebody asked us that question last year. Yeah. And, and you know, on our website, and I'm like, uh, I think Rod, you picked Carlos Pena, and I think I picked um, Roy Joyce. You just yeah. you kind of you pick somebody in the system who's like, hey, mm-hmm. there's some interesting things here, and then it was Justice Bigby, yeah, uh, who we yeah. didn't. I don't think we considered. And, and I guess, like you said, you, you it's hard to know. I, I we we do. I, I don't know how to pronounce. Is it Josue Braseño? Yeah. Is it? Okay. That's, All right. That's what right. I've been. I've been those two years of Spanish class finally paid off. <laughs> um, I, yeah. I. I I'm kind of curious, maybe beyond that, like uh, we can 
go into just a little bit of last year's draft class because those mm -hmm. are just guys we haven't seen much. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's the excitement for, for Max Clark and Kevin McGonigal, obviously. And, and But then there's fun, you know, guys down the line like Jenk Diaz. I think it's Jenk. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be Jetnik. I don't know. Um, so is there anybody in that draft class that you, that you think is uh, really interesting and intriguing, you know, to looking forward to working with? Oh, man, all of them still. I mean, they're also – they're also no, um, you know. I think Andrew Dunford is a is a name that we were all when we when he got down to Lakeland and we saw him. He's a high school, you know, pick, so it's going to take a little bit of time, but it comes out different. I think I think he's got a chance to be a really good pitcher. I think I think Jenk Diaz, who you just you just mentioned, has a chance to um, um, really be a good right handed pitcher. He's big and he's strong. He's just got so much room to grow. Um, Hadn't played a ton of baseball, and so he's just eating up everything that the pitching group is setting his way. Um, you know, I like those middle infielders. We took sort of in the middle rounds, um, Jim Jarvis and and Peck. Um, they can both really defend, and they're fast. They can impact the game in a lot of ways. Uh, that I you just like them, like you just as a, the former coach to me, like they just help you. They they're gonna help a, a big league team win games um in a lot of different ways like and they can both hit I, th I think they both have a chance to to hit enough to like let their defense and their base running their speed and athleticism impact the game um you know callahan i think has a chance he can play center field and there's power in the bat i mean we're gonna have to and he works i think he's a super interesting pick um I'm a big fan of Jaden Ham. Jaden Ham. Yeah, Jaden Ham was striking everybody out, and there's there's deception there. Um, I think you know we like I think what's exciting is he like show that he can, I think he's gonna be a starter. I think there was some thought you know is, he, is it a reliever delivery? But like I think, um, man, he 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 looked really good on the mound, and like, and I think there's gonna be a chance for like a lot of strikeouts. There's not big platoon splits. He's a big strong kid. Donnie Evans has a has a really good slider um just going to be round out the arsenal big strong right handed reliever so it's a good pick i mean look i'm ex like the 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 blood of player development is who we is, is the lifeblood is who we bring in right and whether it's through like a trade or a signing or, or the draft um i really think mark connor and, and rob metz are like their process and like the way they went about this draft the, the guys they sent us i think the whole class like is going to just infuse a ton of talent into the system. I'm curious if there's, I assume, you know, that the entire org has some input, but I'm wondering how much player dev has in the actual draft. Like is it, they ask you, you, go, Hey, can you work with this guy? And you go, Oh yeah, we can work with this guy. Yeah. Yeah. So they did it. We, I, there was really good collaboration, like a, just a ton of zoom calls. A ton, like um, we, we had some presence at the workouts. Um, we had a big meeting kind of before they launched to Detroit. Um, they came to Lakeland and met with myself and and a lot of the members of player development to talk through some names. It's, it was more just like a constant communication from May on than um, like at the end of the day, like they're the experts, like they made every pick and I, I scouting stresses me out. Like, I don't know I've, I've yeah. never really, I've done some college recruiting, but um you know, it's, I think just syncing up though, like, and, and this comes like from the very top of just, there are things that we're looking for in all players. Um, you know, we do, we do talk about like, just good movers all the time. And our sports science department, I think did a really good job of helping identify players in the draft that, you know, those are the guys, those good athletes that are, can make some adjustments. Um, those are the guys, you know, the type of, of athletes that we all want to work with. And, but just syncing up, you know, what the pitching group is trying to do, what, what Kenny and the hitting group are trying to do, what, you know, Scott and AJ are looking for on the major league team. Like, I think you hear this all the time. It's hard to do, but I think we're doing, I think we're doing a pretty good job here. Of, we are speaking the same language from top to bottom here. And uh, we have really good leaders and Scott and Jeff that have given a clear vision of, of, all the way down to the academy and into our international scouting, you know, we're scouting really young kids. I don't know how they do it. They're scouting, you know, 13, 14 year olds. It's, it's refreshing to hear you say that. Yeah. Of the kinds of players we're looking for. 
yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, we're just, you know, amateurs. We go out there. We, we like to, like, I like to think that we're at the point now where we can believe what we're seeing. Mm-hmm. I just think we're, we're, you know, we, we do this for fun. So I'm not seeing probably 75% of what I need to see, but um, it is, it's, it's nice to hear from you know, professionals that go, yeah, this is, it's got to get stressful. It's very hard. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I don't have, I mean, I could, we could ask you questions about every single player. We haven't mentioned Jackson Job once. Uh, which is fine, I guess, or, you know, or Paul Keith or Justin Hermeloy, but, but I did want to, um, basically my last thing was uh, it just this kind of fortuitous timing that popped up yesterday, this, this spring breakout thing mm-hmm. that's happening, uh, which is super fun for prospect nerds like us, but I'm curious, uh, you know, is that, is that going to be fun for you? Is that more of a, a pain? Is it, do you have anything to do with it at all? Um, no, you know, they, they told us about the winter meetings and um, look, I'm, I'm all for, growing the game and um i think i think it's a great opportunity to obviously showcase good young players throughout baseball for like for detroit fans in detroit who are watching on tv i I hope i think it's gonna be televised i hope so i hope it's televised in our mark i I don't know exactly all the details yet but see the next kind of wave of tigers coming like get eyes on them i do think it'll be a fun day for the kids to go out and play like break up some of the monotony of spring training you know, and become an annual event. But, um, you know, I think the other thing that we really are trying to to forge, and I think we're we're getting there, and actually Alan Trammell brought this up, is like just pride in being a Tiger. And, and one of the things that this can do is it's going to have players of all different ages. And they're, they're not all going to, you know, we're going to have players from rookie ball, FCL, all the way to AA, AAA, depending on who's still in major league camp. Like put them all on one field and like just remind them, you're all going to hopefully like play together in Detroit one day and, and, and instill like real sense of, of what the organization is and, and proud to wear that D on their chest. And, and um, I think that'll be the best part of it is, is to get them out on one field and, and just enjoy being Tigers all together one day. I definitely see that happening. There was, there was a lot of camaraderie and just seeing the, the teammates just kind of bond over the last part of the season. They're being down in here quite a bit. Uh, Ryan, thanks for your time. We definitely appreciate it. And I'm not sure what the rest of your off season looks like. Do you get any downtime right now, or is it just uh, just getting re- just essentially prepping? <clears throat> um, you know, spring training's not that far away. We're we're gone. We're starting to get ready, which is kind of our, our most. I, I love spring training, so the holidays usually will slow down, but um, we'll see. Transactions and, and things never stop, but we all know what we signed up for, and we love it. And so, if there's a way to get better, we will. Uh, we will be working, but um, like I said, we all we all. This is a nice time of year. Just slow down a little bit in the holidays, and and um, you know this minor the minor league dead period has definitely slowed things down. It's kind of nice. Everybody got to kind of gets to catch your breath here because um, we can't talk to the players. But January second, we'll ramp back up and and be in Lakeland soon. Awesome. Again, thank you for your time, Ryan, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. All right, guys. Thank for thank you very much for having me.